Hello and welcome back to AP World History Modern. Today we're going to begin our first day looking at Unit 3.2, Empires and Administration. So specifically we're going to be looking at um, a little bit of governance and I guess maybe social as well. All right, so uh, we're going to be doing some claim development and evidence and application. All right, specifically looking at coerced labor. All right, so I guess it's also economic and social. Uh, so our learning objective explain how and why various land-based empires developed and expanded from, from 1450. So we're just going to hit on a, a few of these. I'm not going to do all. Um, I just want to hit on a few of these today and, uh, you know, we just kind of do some, you know, some facts and then some comparisons. All right. And uh, so we're going to start today by looking at the Mexica or the Aztec. And when we looked at this topic in 1.4, we focused in on governance and talked about, um, you know, how it was a tribute state, right? So, you know, it rules from its capital in Tenochtitlan in this area, and then it rules over a pretty wide area um, as a, you know, ex an exacting tribute from that population. You know, and we also looked at um, the religion to some degree, uh, at least it was in your homework last time. And uh, so we're going to talk about this in the, within the context of coerced labor and how it, you know, how it kind of plays, kind of plays out. All right, so, uh, or how it kind of fits into a coerced labor system. All right, so I'm going to pull up the document reader right, and go over the notes like we did in class today. Okay, so. All right. All right. So Aztecs. All right. So uh, I I do a chart in class. Let's um let's recreate this here. So I do a kind of a small top row, kind of a smaller left row, All right? And then leave. All right. Let's do two more to make three different rows. Okay, so there and there, and I'm going to want uh, three distinct columns in addition to this first one. Okay, so there and there we go. All right, and I'll probably end up using both both sides of it. So it should look something like that. Okay. All right. So what are we doing here today? We're looking at, I guess I can just label it with this, uh, coerced. I'm going to zoom in. All right, now that you've made that, right, I'm going to zoom in and put coerced labor practices. All right, I'm going to put purpose. And then I'll put outcomes. All right, outcomes. All right, and we're going to begin. Right, we're going to begin with. Right, we're going to begin with. Uh, I'm just going to zoom this out until we start actually going through these. Right, so let's start with the Americas. And let's do the Mahika slash so the Mahika people ruled over the Aztec Empire. And the Aztecs, all right? And then also in the Americas. All right, let's do uh, let's do the Inca. All right, let's do the Inca. So this is in South America. Right, and then didn't get through this in all of my classes, but I did in some Africa. All right, so let's look at the uh, Songhai. And sometimes it's spelled a Y as well. All right, so let's keep that for this for this side. Right, and let's go ahead and begin. All right, so. We're looking for, you know, coerced labor practices within within uh, Mexica. Right, so what do we know about this? Right, what do we know about this? 
Um, I guess for starters, we know, right, we know that they, uh, they enact tribute, right? This is a tribute state. So, right, we know that they're enacting tribute. Right, tribute from conquered. Right, conquered tribute states. Right, so right, so um, what does this mean? Um, you know, they're not, you know, the Mexica people themselves are not largely doing the labor, right? They're, uh, you know, when you think about agriculture and stuff like that, um, you know, there are, you know, a lot of that is, is being done from the outside, right? So, you know, you look at a population of 200 plus thousand people in Tenochtitlan, which is what you often hear cited by the time you get into the 1500s. Um, you know, I don't care, I don't care how many Chinampas you have. Um, that's not going to feed that population. So, you know, you, uh, you know, you're enacting exactly tribute from the outside to, to supply your people, right? And, uh, you know, and I guess, right, I, and I guess, uh, I guess that kind of segues into this next thing as well, is that we have these things called the flower wars, right? The flower wars, and that's kind of just one way to describe what this is. Um, you know, and so just to kind of describe what that means, um, these are, you know, the purpose, the purpose of these flower wars, just to explain it, is to capture, right, capture prisoners, right, capture prisoners, you know, and uh, let's leave the purpose for later, right, so, uh, you know, why we're actually doing this, but Flower wars are designed to capture prison, prisoners. Um, and I guess I probably should at least just kind of say here that it is these prisoners, right, that are that are performing right, forced labor. Right, and other. <laughs> Let's just kind of leave that until we get to the next column. All right. So so uh, this is what we're seeing here. Um, you know, so much of the agricultural stuff. So I guess I'll kind of put this over here in in the purpose, All right? So these are connected. Um, All right. So the tribute, All right? The tribute itself. A lot of this labor, right? The labor that creates the tribute, right? The labor for agriculture. The labor for agriculture, um, you know, let's just put and supplies, and the other stuff coming in. Um, you know, this is this is being done out in the out in the, the territories, right? So, however, however, the people who are performing this want to, and it's very diverse because it's a very large large area, all right? Um, and then you have this. Right, this tribute wars, um, you know, so when you start talking about labor, okay, what we're talking about here is uh, the Chinampas are not building themselves, the Temple Mayor is not building, building itself, right? So, right, so when you start talking about Chinampas, temples, and all of the other kind of technological marvels that existed, uh, in in Tenochtitlan, the aqueduct system, you know, that brought fresh water down from the surrounding mountains into the, you know, into the city itself, the canals, right, that were built, you know, that you know allowed you access by water into the you know in, into the interior of the city of Tenochtitlan. I mean, the labor for this stuff is not, you know, this is uh, this is being performed largely with prisoners who are being were being enacted from from the flower wars and, and other captives, right? And uh, in in addition to that, right? In addition to that, there's also right religious right religious sacrifice. Right? When you start talking about these prisoners here, right? These prisoners are, are being used for forced labor. 
uh, and also being used for religious sacrifice, right? For the benefit of the state, right? For the benefit of of the state. All right. So, so what do we mean by this? I, you know, in, when I talk about this in class, you know, when you start talking, I, I usually try to make a comparison with with ancient Greece, and uh, the reason for this is, you know, how do you, you know, how do you kind of rationalize? um you know sacrificing a, a human body um you know how do you sacrifice how do you justify killing somebody right taking their life um you know and uh and, and I, I like to make this comparison with ancient greece uh because there's a lot written on this from ancient greece right so we know that the greeks had slaves and you know some of them come from debt peonage and you know and, and other ways like that but you know a lot of them also come from war captains and and uh you know so if you kind of play this out, right? How do you justify enslaving somebody who is a war captain? Um, right. So you, you, uh, someone has risen up against you. They have contested you. They fought a battle with you, which means they were trying to fight you to the death. Um, when a battle is won and not everyone is dead, what do you do with the survivors? Um, you know, you, you know, do you trust them to to not rise up again? Um, you know, do you just throw them? You know, do you, uh, or do you just massacre them all, kill them all because you know you can't trust them? Um, you know, so under this kind of Greek rationalization, one of the thoughts is that maybe you enslave them, right? So if you enslave your prisoners of war, then, you know, that may be viewed or that could be viewed as, as being merciful. So instead of taking their lives, you're simply enslaving them. Then at that point, their life is in your hands, right, to do whatever whatever you choose to do with it, since you you are the one who spared that life when they became your war captain. Right. So when you look at slavery through that kind of lens, right, that's you know, maybe maybe this is how the Mexica viewed this as well. Um oh, I've never read this anywhere. I'm just gonna just kind of kind of imagine what's going through the the heads of of uh, the Mexica here. You know, and um you know so so when you you know when you capture them, you know, maybe performing a human sacrifice on them, um, you know, instead of labor, right? Either one, um, you know, could be justified, right? So it could be justified. So uh, anyway, that's that is that. Um, what's the outcome of this, right? So the outcome of this is you know thousands, thousands of indigenous. Thousands of indigenous people sacrificed annually, right? And and uh, I mean, you often hear that number twenty thousand thrown around. Um, that you know, at its peak, the Mexico were killing twenty thousand people and human sacrificing twenty thousand people. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I don't really know about that. I don't remember reading those kinds of numbers. Um, you know, I've read a couple of the books that were written by the conquistadors when, when they were there. And they spent a decent amount of time, um, you know, in, in Tenochtitlan uh, when they were there. And, uh, you know, and, and these things were described, um, you know, with, with horror, um, you know, which I always kind of find ironic, I guess, um, that the Spanish were so horrified. Um, you know, by, by, by witnessing this, uh, when you consider that, you know, they're coming from Spain and the Spanish Inquisition uh, was still up and running at this point. So public displays of violence would not have been uh, you know, something, to, something to be that shocked by, um, one would imagine. But, you know, that's often how it gets portrayed. Um, you know, but, so, but the number of 20,000, I mean, I, I, I just don't, I don't remember getting that from what I was reading. So I mean I I don't know about that. So let's say up to twenty thousand, right? So you know was there was there uh, hundreds? I think undoubtedly there were probably hundreds. Uh, were there thousands? Yeah, maybe there were thousands, right? Um, you know I think thousands is a good you know probably a good way to put it. Up to twenty thousand a year, if you would need a number, which I don't know why you really would. All right, so let's move on. Um, we also have this practice. Right was ended by the Spanish. Right, so 
All right, so the Spanish will come in, they'll spend, uh, you know, six, eight months in Tenochtitlan. Uh, they will get chased out, and then we see the siege of Tenochtitlan over the next two years. So by 1521, the Mexica are captured and, and conquered, and you'll see an end put to, put to this practice. All right. All right. Let's go over. Um, so in class, you know, in class, what we do here is, um, you know, I, I show the first three minutes of this video, and I'll put a link to this on my on my Google Sites uh, webpage. Um, this is the Engineering and Empire, uh, the Aztecs video. I, I play the first three minutes, to, you know, to, just to show, um, you know, a little added bit to the story about why the Mexica settled on Lake Texcoco. It also shows you some of the technological innovations um, you know, of the city, right? And uh, you know, it also shows you kind of you know how how established human sacrifice was um, that had already been adopted by the Mexica by the time they settled in the Central Valley of Mexico. Um, you know, and so it will simply continue. So we show that, and and then I and then I show this clip. It's off a History Channel uh, video, just kind of. You know, kind of going into a little bit of gory depth um, about about uh, this this practice. Um, definitely don't need to watch this video. This is you know more of a curiosity than anything else. Um, but yeah, but this is actually a really good video. Um, you know, for you know for learning about the techno you know, technology as well. So I mean, I would recommend watching um, this. You know, just given the restraints of class, we just don't have time, right? But uh, but it is a it is an excellent video. All right. All right. Next, then we move on right, after we after I show those couple of clips in class. Um, right, we move on and go over the you know go over the Aztecs. All right. So not Aztecs, the Inca. All right. So I don't know. Let me get me another pen here. I don't know where all my pens have gone. Have to reorganize this thing today. All right. So let's do Inca. So we know that we're talking about the Mita primarily, right? The the Mita system. All right. So what is the Mita system? It's a corvée. Labor. It's a corvée labor system. All right. So what is what does that mean? It's just a kind of a fancy French phrase. Uh, that means um, unpaid labor. Right, let me zoom in a little bit because that blue is a little light. Right, it's unpaid labor in lieu. Right, in lieu of taxes. And, uh, and I don't know if my students just feel more comfortable comfortable this year than in past years, uh, but uh, I had a number of them ask me what does in lieu of mean. Um, it's just one of those colloquial kind of sayings that we that we use. Um, in lieu of means instead of. So it was asked in class today, so I figured I'd just add it. All right, so the Mita, right, that very well-known coerced labor system of of the Inca. All right, so this is imposed right, imposed upon you know imposed upon uh, all able bodied right all able bodied inca inca citizens starting at age 50. All right so about your age right you'd be required to perform to perform state service all right so required right required to perform labor Right, required to perform labor, and usually, right, usually local, right. So kind of labor you could do during the day, and then go home and, and rest. Um, you know, and duration, right? Duration depended, it depends, right, on season and location. You know, if you are, you know, if, if you are up in the mountains in the Andes, you know, in a 
in a region that is involved in terrace farming, then obviously the planting season, you know, the you know the first, you know, the months right after winter, dealing with the the frost heaves, you know, so repairing the terraces and then planting, um, you know, obviously during that time of year it's going to be a little extra time, you know, or during the harvest it's going to be uh, a little extra time, like in, you know. Um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe two, you know, week, two weeks out of a month, so maybe a little bit longer, um, you know, during, in that same region, you know, during the non planting and, and harvest, you know, they may simply be a few days out of a month. All right. So, and, uh, you know, kind of similar application of that concept, you know, if you live down near the Pacific ocean and you were involved in, in fishing, All right. Um, I'm just going to throw in here. I didn't you know, because I don't know if, uh, if this I don't know what percentage of the population this would fall under and also this is you know, this is uh, kind of the upper class as well not who you typically think of when it comes to um, coerced labor you know I think chosen women might be justified in in throwing in here because they do perform labor for you know, an entire variety of, of things, right, in, in the service of the emperor. Um, you know, and uh, so I think chosen women can be thrown in here, in here as well, right, because their entire lives is going to be a, be an example of, of a form of labor, all right, um, once they are selected. All right, so what else we have here? Um, purpose, right, what is the purpose of the NEPA system? Um, of course, it's building... Right, building the famous Inca Road. Right, the famous Inca Road. Uh, of course, the bridges. Right, this is a road system that runs through the Andes Mountains. So you got to span ravines and the such. Uh, terraces. Right, you got to build terrace. The T -E. right. <laughs> you got to build terraces. And of course, once you have those terraces, you need to terrace. Here today, you need a terrace farm, right? And and just to kind of throw this in here, what kind of crops do we often associate? I'm just going to write one because it's the most well known. And that's potato. Right, so a potato, right? First, that plant was first domesticated on the shores of Lake Titicaca, um, in in what is today uh, kind of the Peruvian Bolivian border there. All right, all right. So uh, right, terrace, terrace farming, potato, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and of course, um, chosen women, you know, and then we should just kind of note here with this chosen women, um, you know, there is, there is labor, right, that involves food, you know, clothing, right, you know, kind of domestic, oops, domestic, <laughs> right, I mean, there is that. Right, but this is also something that comes up sometimes in classes. Does does the Inca perform human sacrifice? Uh, yes. Right. They're, so the chosen women were tapped for religious sacrifice as well. Right. And and I did upload a little video onto this to the YouTube here onto this channel. Um, that sh that shows you. Uh, let's see if I can find that video. There it is. All right, so it's uh, this Inca sacrifice clip. So uh, you know, one of the one of the realities of you know, one of the realities of uh, you know, kind of a, an increasingly warming climate that we currently have right now um, is that we have. Um, oh, and I just realized I didn't show you show the other screen. All right, so uh, it's this is this is it. All right, so if you look at uh, the Inca sacrifice clip. This will show you the, the sacrifice of sacrifice of, of one of the chosen women. Um, so yeah, so this is one of those things associated with kind of warming climate is that the glaciers in the Andes Mountains are receding. And as those glaciers recede, it's opening up parts of the mountain that that were that were open back in the late 1400s and early 1500s. Um, you know, before the before the little ice age kind of hit its peak. So yes, yeah, so we're we're finding finding um, evidence 
of, of sacrifice um, up, in those, up in those regions. All right. All right, so there's that. All right, outcomes. All right, outcomes. Um, as far as other outcomes, the um, this is probably the best way to say this is Spanish with um, the Spanish uh, yes it's Spanish Nita. So same word, just with the word Spanish in front of it. All right, so this becomes something that we will talk about again. Um, so this is, uh, you know, this, this Corvée labor system was adapted. All right, adapted and used by the Spanish. For mining and cash crops for mining and for cash crops uh, specifically and this is something we will deal with later is <laughs> why I can't spell today S-I-L-V there we go correct that error All right silver All right so specifically referring to Potosi all right uh, it's probably the most famous piece um, so what do we see here? We, we know that the Spanish are adapting this, uh, but for a very different purpose, okay, for a very different purpose. And because of the purpose, um, it's not going to be local anymore. Right? So if you're a silver mining, uh, you obviously need to go to the mines. You know? So the idea of doing some labor and then being able to come home is, is not a possibility. Right? So no longer local um, and duration Right, duration is increased, aka it's longer. All right, um, you know, so you might have to, you know, you have to leave home, you might have to leave home for years at a time. So, and of course, then we'll talk about this. You know more when we get into you know, into this topic you know but instead of being gone for you know or having to do work for two or three days a month in the off season and then maybe two or three weeks in a month during the during the peak times of year you might have to be gone for two or three years out of seven um you know and uh you know in, in work in the mines right in, in places that have nicknames like the mountain that eats men um right so you know it's a it, it's a very different adaptation all right so in class after we after we uh finish that um i showed a little video clip from this video here um the weaving right the weaving uh weaving the bridge right and and this shows the practice of of mita really still being performed today that you know the kind of communal exercise um that is Mita in order to you know in order to provide um uh, infrastructural types of projects that can only be done as a community um you know so i'll put that video on my web page as well um and these are things that you you just can't do this by yourself you can't do this with a family you know you need uh, an entire community to work together in order to accomplish that kind of stuff all right so that and then and we kind of moved a little bit on um in class and zoom out here a little bit right and went on to the went on to the Songhai right so with the Songhai we look at um, I'm to pull something up here all right uh, so with the Songhai we I guess I don't even have it I guess not all right, with the Songhai, we started with um, right, slave caste existed. Right, a slave caste or a permanent, right, a permanent social gratification. A 
permanent social stratification. So, right, individuals, right, inherited that status. Slave status. Right. Um, and then in addition to that, you also have other slaves that, you know, that are, that come from, you know, kind of other traditional means, like prisoners of war, debtors, and criminals. You know, people who rob merchants coming off the Sahara Desert, right? Were also enslaved. All right, so we would, have, we would have gone through that. All right. All right. Um, you know, beyond that, just give me one second. I'm just going to pull something up. All right. In Africa, right, so in Africa, right. most men and some women, right, most men and some women did agricultural. And most women and some men right, served in households. All right, and the thing that kind of makes this different than the others is, you know, and this is something that we saw in, in the earlier time period as well, 1200 to, to 50, um, is that we're not just talking about a coerced labor system that exists within the state itself. We're also talking about a coerced labor system in which they are import, or exporting um, you know, members of their population out. Right? So I guess we can say you know, the vast majority um, you know, pre-1500 you know, pre, uh, pre um, the vast majority are headed towards Dar al Islam, right, and uh, right, and and or the Indian Ocean. Um, so let me just kind of separate this a little bit, right? So Dar al Islam versus individuals headed towards the Indian Ocean world, right? So within the you know within the Indian Ocean world, um, talking most often. Right, most often uh, become household workers, but very few, you know, would have would have gone into the Indian Ocean trade network from the Songhai. Um, that would have been more from the East African Swahili coast trading network, but it was not out of the realm of possibility. Um, right. Because once you are in Dar al Islam, then you, know, you can enter into that network easily enough. All right, so, uh, you know, within Dar al Islam, enslaved, right, enslaved individuals from the Songhai um, often performed agricultural work. Right, of course. Cotton is being grown in Dar al Islam. Um, you know, the infrastructure associated with this, like the digging of kinats, is gonna is gonna be another another thing. And by the time we get into the 1400s and, and early 1500s, you're starting to see sugarcane, right, being grown on the islands in the Caribbean, right, and uh, so you would start to have seen some of that as well. Um, 
All right, so, so, yeah, so there's there's that. There's also other infrastructure. You know, also infrastructure draining of swamps and deltas and the such. Uh, canals being built, irrigation canals being built. Yeah. So you're also going to see infrastructure and household. All right. Let's slide this on over. Let's slide this on over. And right. And just wrap up here with with some outcomes. Um, right. So lastly, in Africa. Right, what is the uh, what is the you know, what is the outcome of this? Uh, I mean, we are going to spend a decent amount of time talking about um, slavery and the slave trade, and you know, we'll be looking at demographic impacts, right? Kind of demographic impacts of of this. We will talk about um, you know beyond the demographic impacts. You know, we'll look at uh, gender implications. Right, because we will see a gender imbalance created over the long term, you know, um, you know, after the Songhai fall in 15, 1591, um, you know, we're, we're going to see these kinds of these kinds of issues, um, these kinds of issues rise up, right? But just kind of long term, long term outcomes, um, you know, the last, right, the last West African state. To make slavery illegal, right? Make it a crime, right? Make it a crime uh, was Mauritania. And that was in 2007, right? It was when uh, the last. The last state was to outlaw. Um, but we'll also talk about, you know, the um, in future units, of the slave trade, and the abolition of it. The abolition of the slave trade, specifically in uh, in, in the Atlantic, in the Atlantic slave trade. Right in the Indian Ocean. Yes, we will talk about this later, but just in a nutshell, you know, the the British will will institute a uh, a ban on on uh, on the Atlantic slave trade. You know, in the first decade of the of the eighteen hundreds. You know, as far as the exploitation of enslaved individuals. Um, off the continent of Africa, um, you know, and then they will make illegal in their own colonies in the 1830s um, in the Caribbean, um, the institution of slavery, right? So, but that's not going to, you know, them, them outlawing it is not going to end the, you know, in the Atlantic slave trade. Um, you know, so you'll see the Atlantic slave trade still operational, um, even though it's, even though it was illegal, made up until the 1880s and into the 90s when, you know, you know, maybe years after the decades after you know the the last major state in the Americas abolished slavery, uh, which was Brazil, right? And of course, in the Indian Ocean, um, you know, you will see. We'll talk about this, I guess. When we talk about imperialism. Uh, is that one of the justifications given by the British to to conquer Zanzibar uh, was to abolish the you know the uh, the Muscat, you know, the old Omani um, slave trade, right? So. You know, so that was in 1890 uh, when the British take over uh, Zanzibar you know, and kind of formally in that Atlantic slave trade. Um, but once again, that doesn't mean slavery until you know, into the 1920s in Dar al Islam, right? And, and some of the last holdouts there. All right. All right. So there's, uh, so there's, there's some of that, right? About the Songhai. Um, you know, and, and that's about all we did in class, right? So, you know, as far as uh, what you need to do, you know, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna wrap this up, and then I'm gonna give you some additional if you want. All right. Um, so there's some of that NITA information. All right. If you are interested, uh, I think we just went through this. 
All right, so, you know, as far as um, wrapping it up, right, before I go through and give you some more, uh, coerced labor systems existed in all the empires. So think about how they're intertwined with the state and governance and control and ruling, uh, and think how they're interrelated with religious practices sometimes as well. You know, and try to make some connections, like, you know, is uh, who is similar to who and how are they different from each other? Um, and the ones I'm going to give you in a second will, you know, after you get a few more of these, you know, you might be able to make some of these more meaningful connections that will help you remember, help you remember them. All right. So if you're going to stay on, then stay on. If not, sapriati. All right. And, uh, and thanks. All right. So um, additional to what we did in class today, right? Um, you know, I just want to throw this out and let you pause on this. And, and I'm just going to run through it really quick. Uh, so in Russia. Right. We talked about Russia yesterday. We mentioned serfdom yesterday. We even talked about Catherine the Great in the institution yesterday. So serfdom will, will survive and persist as a coerced labor system in Russia, primarily for agricultural purposes, you know, but also resource extraction right, as the time goes on. Um, the outcome here is abolished right, in 1861 uh, by Alexander II, right? but will persist in some places up until, up until 1892 within Russia. Um, but it doesn't simply cleanly get abolished, and the way it's abolished creates creates some tension within within Russia. Um, a couple of others, right? And uh, I guess Ottomans in China are the only ones I I uh, didn't give you. So I guess that would be the three, right? the three that you could write on the back. All right. So right, the Ottomans. You know, so tribute comes in from conquered people. Remember, the Ottomans are highly decentralized. So you will see tribute coming into Istanbul uh, from conquered peoples. Uh, but also the Dev Sherm, right? The Dev Sherm exists, um, you know, and we'll talk about that. And then enslaved Africans are being acquired from East Africa. So across the Trans-Sahara trade route, this is from the Songhai. Um, but also from the Omanis, right, in, uh, in East Africa. So, right, so you're seeing enslaved Africans coming in. To the Ottoman Empire. So purpose, tribute, dev sherm, or educated, trained for administrative and military service and, and paid salaries, right? Later even could gain timbers, um, tax farmers, right? Become tax farmers. Um, enslaved Africans often did agricultural work, infrastructural work, right? Um, and out comes the tribute and dev sherm sometimes becomes or, you know, influential members of society. Um, in part of the first standing army. And of course, the Dev Sherm was finally abolished in 16, in those reforms of 1610 after the Anatolian revolts. All right. Um, China. China largely has free peasants, um, you know, but many had to work the landowners' farms and debt peonage, you know, is not an uncommon thing. Uh, and also prisoners, right? Prisoners do coerce labor. So when you talk about things like the Summer Palace of the Ming Dynasty that was built during the Ming Dynasty, that massive lake in the Summer Palace was dug by slaves. Um, you know, so you know, prisoners largely is what we're what you're talking about there. Um, right, so there is, you know, China is not without its coerced labor um, during the Ming Ming and definitely not the Qing era. Um, but you know that a lot of that coerced labor, you know, debt peonage and the such is mainly agrarian. Um, you know, but I mean, a lot of that work is being performed by a free peasantry. And so, you know, some dynasties, right, like the song, provide medical care for the indigent. All right. Um, but yeah, so, you know, as far as free peasants, um, that will persist in China right up until, right up until the 1950s, right? Until, until Mao. All right. All right. So that's, uh, that's about it. All right. So, uh. I will, I will sign off. Stop reality.